Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of scripture which we read just a few moments ago, <clears throat> Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. Today we are in part 12 of Sing to the Lord. Now, the last time we were in Exodus, we've had a lot of specials going on around here. Even more specials broke into our evening services, but last time we were in Exodus was April 30th. On uh, Sunday, May the 7th, that was graduation Sunday. I was down in Alabama and Florida for uh, four graduations. Uh, one son with a PhD, one daughter-in-law with a Master of Science in Nursing, and one uh, son with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, and one daughter with a Bachelor of Science in Biology. It was a big week, a lot of stress, driving back, horrible rain, unbelievable traffic, what normally should have taken me from Florida up to my daughter's house in Tennessee, that's normally an 11 hour drive, took me 18 hours. And the next day, what should have taken about 12 hours, took me 19 hours. And it's not because my van is so slow. <laughs> we actually had many times stopped on the interstate dead stop because of accidents and a horrible weather. So thank you for your prayers. I got in at three o'clock in the morning last Saturday and was totally exhausted, but praise God we made it. So last Sunday was Mother's Day, and then today we are back to Sing to the Lord, part 12. So please turn with me there to Exodus chapter 15. Let me begin with just a, a quick review where we uh, start with the 11th principle. We need that for undergirding what we're going to say today. The 11th principle related to music and language. What is the music saying across the cultures? And as I've pointed out the last time we were together, this is very important because we've talked about offering strange fire to the Lord and how that principle applies to many different areas of the Christian life. We applied the principle to music by asking some pointed questions because music is in fact a universal language. It transcends culture and it communicates something about the culture and the context in which the music was developed. So we asked a number of questions. First, how was this music originally used in the culture where it originated? Was it used for the glory of God or was it used for demon worship, for example? Number two, did those who developed these forms use them to glorify God in a specific way commanded in scripture? Or if it's demon worship, then of course that makes it strange fire. Number three, even if this particular music did not spring directly out of pagan worship, is it the fruit of that kind of music brought to full bloom? And then four, we finally raise the question, how do you know what you can use in worship music? How do you know what you can use and what is dangerous to use, keeping in mind that the scripture commands us, doesn't suggest, it commands us that we must do all for the glory of God. That is an overriding principle for the entire Christian life from the moment well, from the moment you are conceived to the moment of your death. If you're among God's elect, all to the glory of God. All to the glory of God. All to the glory of God. That's a rather all-encompassing principle. We looked at Colossians 3.23. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Verse 17 of Colossians 3 gives further insight. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. We saw that there were two keys to verse 23. Do it enthusiastically, that is, with all your heart. When you're in the center of God's will, that should cause you great joy. If you are glorifying God, you will be in the center of his will. Second, clarify your focus. Jesus Christ is the center. Is he the center of your music? Get rid of the question, what will other people think? You are glorifying the Lord and you are doing it for him alone. Do everything as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. That's how it goes on in verse 25. Doing all, that includes your music, to the glory of God, as he defines to his glory, informs us of the kind of interaction that we have with others that pleases and therefore glorifies God. We saw in the next few verses, if you are back there in Colossians uh, chapter 3, we saw how God gives specific instructions as to how we are to do all to the glory of God. So we don't have to guess. We don't have to make it up. 
God wants us to give him the glory, so he has painstakingly set out for us the process step by step. In a nutshell, that's what's called the Christian life, or walking in the spirit, or walking by faith, or progressive sanctification. That happens when we do every detail in a manner that is in conformity with the revealed will of God for the Christian life. Folks, God is serious about you and me giving him all the glory, not just some of it, giving him all the glory because he's worthy. No one else is worthy of the glory like God is worthy of the glory. So that'll give you a start if you've never analyzed Colossians 3 in the context of how the practical Christian life gives glory to God through music. Colossians 3, principles there that will help you to do that. On the opposite side of the coin, we see all of creation, especially believers, bringing glory to God. On the opposite side of that, we see God manifesting his own glory. So two sides to glory of God. We give him glory, God manifests glory. Music displays a major facet of that truth, a major facet of the truth of giving glory to God. We're going to talk about that a little bit in a moment. We looked at multiple passages where God manifested his own glory to get an idea how we should bring glory to him. We then applied the principles and asked the question, does the music that you listen to and perform reflect the kind of glory that we studied? I jumped over lots of things, but you remember all those different points of what brings glory to God. So ask the question, does that music that you use and listen to and perform reflect that kind of glory? Does it connect you to the glory of the Shekinah radiating around the throne of God? Does it make you bow in humble amazement and worship before the God of heaven and earth? That brought us to the third key point where we can see how to glorify God through music. Third, God also manifested his glory in the book of Revelation where we find a lot of music. Book of Revelation has a lot of music. We're going to be studying that, the Lord willing, on Sunday evenings in a few weeks when we um, finish the book of Acts. The Lord willing, we'll go on to Revelation. We looked at an overview of the glory of God in Revelation, discovered that every chapter in Revelation manifests a different facet of the glory of God. It focuses on the glory of God in not only the throne room vision of chapter 4, but throughout the book. The glory of God inspires awe and wonder. <clears throat> Does the music that you listen to inspire awe and wonder at the glory of God. Then we looked at other ways in which the Bible says God is glorified. We looked how God is glorified when the word of God is glorified and we asked the question, does the so-called Christian music that you listen to glorify the Bible? Is the music an appropriate setting for the eternal words of scripture or is it like using pornography to teach Bible memory verses? Fifth, God was glorified in creation. We looked at a lot dealing with that. Six, the restoration of the nation of Israel brings glory to God. Many passages state that when Israel is restored, that will bring God glory. There is coming a day when Israel, on the face of the earth, with King Jesus ruling in Jerusalem, will bring intense glory to God. Seventh, and that was where we began on April 30th, God is glorified when he judges the heathen. A lot of places in the Old Testament tell us that God is glorified when he judges the heathen. So let's apply that principle to music. How much modern so-called Christian music speaks about the wrath and judgment of God? Are there in fact any songs in the CCM repertoire that speak of the judgment of God? If there are, are they the popular ones that make all the young people wiggle their bodies as the musicians screech and the strobe lights flash? Are the judgment songs the ones that you listen to? Ezekiel 28, verse 22 says, And say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, O Zidon, and I will be glorified in the midst of thee, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall have executed judgments in her, and shall be sanctified in her. Listen to what God says about killing his enemies. In chapter 39, Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them. It shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified saith the Lord God. Did you know God will be glorified when he judges? Does your so-called Christian music ever, ever mention the coming judgments that God will pour out on the earth? He will be glorified and all the earth will tremble in awe and fall down before him. 
How many CCM pieces have that as their theme? I gave you some illustrations from historical music, like the magnificent Dies Irae, The Day of Wrath, written by Giuseppe Verde. It makes you tremble to think of the day that Jesus judges the earth. You hear the wail of the sinners being cast into hell. It should make you question your own salvation. Am I saved or will I face that wrath? That glorifies God. Ninth, God is glorified when believers bear the fruit of the Spirit. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Application. Here's a very good place to test the fruit of the music that you listen to. Does the music you love and listen to motivate you, or does it motivate anybody for that matter, to bear the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Does the music that you love, that you listen to, that perhaps you perform, does it motivate you to bear the fruit of the Spirit? Or does it merely stimulate your libido and motivate you to indulge your flesh, your old sin nature? And do the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, the questions that we ask in relation to the fruit of the Spirit and music those are not irrelevant or petty questions. They go to the very heart of Christian living. Here's the heart of the matter. Here is the heart of the matter. This is where music is one of the principal tools in the spiritual war. You see, God designed music to motivate and to empower, motivate, empower, your spirit to godly Christian living. But the devil has perverted music to stimulate and empower your flesh. Stimulate and empower your flesh to wickedness and evil thoughts and evil words and evil actions. That was the ninth principle that we just looked at there. The tenth point is of doing all to the glory of God is also permanently tied to that principle. That first one related to the fruit of the Spirit, but tenth, God is glorified when we exercise our spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are not the same thing as the fruit of the Spirit. And we're not talking about the charismatic phenomenon, the counterfeit of gifts that existed during the writing of the New Testament canon, which have ceased, there are seven of those, apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of um, wisdom, excuse me, gift of knowledge, which was the reception of new special revelation. Those things have ceased. Charismatics still are faking it with those. The devil is still empowering people to counterfeit those things. But now we have the question about the gifts. God is glorified when we exercise our spiritual gifts, such as I'm exercising the gift of pastor teacher. There's also the gift of evangelist. There's a gift of helps. There's a gift of government. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are 14 other gifts. First Peter 4 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. This is in the context of Peter discussing the spiritual gifts. They're the speaking gifts, like teacher and pastor teacher. They're the gifts of ministration, the gifts of humble service, gifts of giving, gift of helps, and so on. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. When you exercise your spiritual gifts, and he covers both the leadership gifts and the servant gifts, he gives you the whole ball of wax in, those, in that verse there in the context of a discussion of the spiritual gifts, he says that when you exercise those, that God in all things may be glorified. 
Are you exercising your spiritual gift? Do you even know what your spiritual gifts are? I spent something like 21 weeks going through the spiritual gifts in the evening worship service about three years ago. We pointed out what everyone was, which ones were only during the apostolic period, which ones are still available for today, how they are supposed to manifest and what's supposed to be done with them, and the fact that every believer has at least one gift. Because God put you in this body to exercise your gift. He's the one who moves people from place to place, puts them in different local churches because that particular gift is needed by that church so that it can function most perfectly in the setting where God placed it to minister and reach the world for Christ. Are you using your spiritual gift? It's a way in which God is glorified. So, we saw how the fruit of the Spirit ties in with music. Let's use the gifts as another place to apply the test of music that you listen to. Does the so-called CCM, Christian Contemporary Music, motivate people to exercise the permanent spiritual gifts of evangelist, pastor, teacher, teacher, helps government, self-control, and so on? Or does it stimulate the flesh to imitate, to counterfeit, and to attempt to practice the temporary sign gifts. The music, does it motivate you to exercise the gifts that God still has available for the church today? Or does it motivate to imitate, to counterfeit and practice the temporary sign gifts of apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation, tongues, and knowledge, which we just mentioned a moment ago. Let me ask the question this way. Which kind of music floods the Pentecostal and charismatic churches? Are, are, are the Pentecostal and charismatic churches, are, are they flooded with classical music? <laughs> or are they flooded with contemporary Christian music? And all the degraded forms of so-called, so-called Christian rock. If you've been coming on Wednesday evening, we have seen hundreds of examples, video footage from charismatic churches all over the world where the so-called worship puts the infant believers into a trance where they writhe on the floor like snakes, bark like dogs, heap themselves together in piles of men and women wiggling all over each other. That tells you the source when you see the manifestations of the counterfeit spirit channeled into foolish churchgoers and triggered by Baal worship music. Eleventh, God is glorified when we offer him thanksgiving. Second Corinthians 4.15, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. When you're giving thanks, you're giving glory to God. Application, does the music you listen to fill your heart with overwhelming thanksgiving to God? Twelfth, God is glorified in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the life of the believer. We see the Lord Jesus Christ saying so in John 17, 4. That's his great high priestly prayer. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So God was clearly glorified in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that Jesus, just a few verses later, applies that to you? Verse 10. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Application. Does the music you listen to make a credible and authentic impact to the glory of God on everybody around you in a way that your life affects them with holiness and with purity? Jesus lived a perfect, holy life. Jesus lived a perfect, pure life. Jesus lived a perfect life in obedience to the revealed will of God. And you have the revealed will of God because you've got Bibles. The people who see you. Your life is supposed to bring glory to God. The music that you listen to. How does it transform your life so that you are bringing glory to God? Thirteenth. God is glorified when believers patiently suffer for Christ. 1 Peter 4.14 if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. As you're suffering for Christ, 
If you bear it the way Jesus bore it, God is glorified. Let's apply it to music. Does the so-called Christian music that you listen to fortify and strengthen you in times of suffering and persecution? And on the flip side, does the so-called Christian music that you listen to make the pagans around you uncomfortable? Or are they perfectly fine listening with you at work, on the job, in the car, or elsewhere because it's really no different than the music that they listen to anyway? Do they reproach you because of your Christian music or do they just wiggle along with you to the beat? That brings us to the new material for today. This is number 14. This is new material now. God is glorified through the keeping of his promises. God is glorified through the keeping of his promises. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God, get the last two words, by us. By us. It's not just, okay, Jesus did that, Paul did that. Last two words. By us. Application. Does the tenor of the music you listen to ever cause your mind, ever, cause your mind to rest on the promises of God? You see, God is glorified through the keeping of his promises, and the music is supposed to bring glory to God, and so this is one of the ways in which music is supposed to glorify God by causing you to dwell on the promises of God. Does it do that? I can even listen to wordless music of the right nature, and you know something? It brings to mind promises of God. It gives me comfort in times of grieving and suffering, sorrow. Yesterday would have been my wedding anniversary with Judy had she lived. I heard some beautiful music. It reminded me of the promises of God that I will see her again someday. It doesn't just have to be music with Christian words. It can be music that exalts and lifts your spirit up to consider heaven and what Peter calls the great and precious promises. Does the music you listen to ever cause your mind to rest on the promises of God? Or does it merely dull your mind into a stupor that never clearly articulates the promises of God? Or worse, does it put you into a catatonic state, a kind of spiritual buzz, where your brain goes numb and you get the warm fuzzies just like you would taking some kind of a hallucinogenic drug? You see, the right kind of music does not dull your spiritual senses. Let me say that again. The right kind of music does not dull your spiritual senses. Instead, it heightens your spiritual senses. It draws you closer to God while your mind is still alert and still intact, not buzzed out. You know, genuine worship does not make you spaced out. I hope you understand that. Genuine worship does not make you spaced out like you see people on the videos that have been showing on Wednesday evening. They're theoretically doing praise and worship music and you see a bunch of them like this, their eyes are closed and, and then they fall over backwards and they wiggle on the floor. Genuine worship does not make your mind spaced out. It makes it alert and intact and focused on God. Number 15, God will be glorified in the believers when Christ comes at the rapture. God will be glorified in the believers when Christ comes at the rapture. One of the, you know, one of the key New Testament books dealing with the rapture and the second coming is 2 Thessalonians. Listen to what verse 10 says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Okay, let's apply it to music. Does the music that you listen to ever make you passionately yearn for the return of Christ? Does the music that you listen to ever make you passionately yearn for the return of Christ? We hope to deal with the difference between the rapture and the second coming uh, in just a few weeks when we begin our study of the book of Revelation in the evening service. But regardless of how you think about it right now or whether that's still a fuzzy concept in your mind, does the music you listen to ever make you long to see Jesus? Number 16. Those who covet the glory of God for themselves or who refuse to glorify him are under his wrath. Those who covet the glory of God for themselves or those who refuse to glorify him are under his wrath. His wrath. Let me explain. And how that relates to music. That's certainly clear with the musical being Lucifer. He's the most musical being God ever created. We already studied that uh, in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel chapter uh, 28. It should be a clear warning signal when you see and hear certain so-called Christian musical artists basking in their own glory and grinning like idiots as they accept the audience applause. Just remember where all that kind of stuff got started. Satan, the rebellious angel and the most musical being God ever created, coveted the glory of God for himself and is now under the extreme judgment that will end in hell. His destination in hell is guaranteed because he wanted the glory of God. The five great I wills of Isaiah chapter 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's number two. Number three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Number four, I will ascend into the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That was number five. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Ezekiel 28, son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, we've talked about the prince of Tyrus, that was a human king. Now he's going to talk about who he calls the king of Tyrus, but clearly not a human being. And say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. There were four in Eden. God walked with Adam and Eve. There was Adam and there was Eve. And there was a serpent. We know it's not God that he's talking about. We know it's not Adam and Eve that he's talking about right now because it tells you what he was like. You've been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was like covering. The sardius and topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and the gold. Adam and Eve had fig leaves. This isn't describing Adam and Eve. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes, musical instruments. Remember, we talked, did a whole study on those. Was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. They're built into his body. Thou art the anointed cherub, definitely not Adam and Eve. The anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Most musical being that God ever created, and he wanted to use it for his own glory. Let's apply the principle to music and musicians, and I think it should be self-evident. God designed music as one of the forms of expression that brings him the highest amount of glory. God designed music. God's the originator of music. 
There is music in heaven. And God designed it to bring him the highest glory. Therefore, the perversion of music for the glory of another is one of the highest forms of blasphemy. Let me pause for just a minute to correct a common misconception. Blasphemy is not merely connecting a curse word to the name of God, although that is a form of blasphemy. The real heart of blasphemy is when a creature or a created being tries to ascribe to himself or to herself prerogatives that belong only to God. In other words, when a demon or a human being tries to usurp for himself the glory of God, they are committing the sin of blasphemy. In fact, it's the very heart of blasphemy. I think you're aware of the fact that there is an enormous amount of music, including much so-called Christian music, that by its very nature refuses to obey the principles of glory of glorifying God that we've been discussing. And in that way, it does not glorify God. But instead, it glorifies the world, the flesh, the devil. It promotes the flesh. It ascribes to the glory of the composer, the musician, or something else. You know, not only the devil is under the judgment of God for doing this, but so are people. Paul states so in Romans chapter 1. Beginning in verse 18, we see men who refuse to glorify God are under his judgment. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now he tells you the reason, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Get down to verse 32, he tells you all the horrible things that they did including the so-called popular sin of sodomy, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They approve of it. They may not be into it, but they approve of it. God says, worthy of death. Okay, key application here. So why do we balk at applying this principle to music that we use in worship? You see, it applies to every area of the Christian life, glorifying God, including our music. And you know something, after all of this study, we've only scratched the surface of glory to God alone and how it applies to music. I'm going to put a parenthesis in here for just a second. It's a subject for another time, but there is a very tightly related doctrine to this, and you probably picked it up. They glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. Giving glory to God is permanently attached to thanksgiving. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, just like do all to the glory of God. It's directly parallel to giving glory to God alone. In everything includes music. In other words, all of your music should be a form of giving thanks to God. Everything to the glory of God. Everything thanks to God. Those are the two basic things that God requires of every man. Because both cover everything. Giving glory to God deals with his person. Giving thanks to God deals with his work. You glorify him for who he is. You thank him for what he's done. Person and work. You know, the gospel has those two elements also. The person and work of Christ. Who Jesus is, what he did. He's both God and man, and that's his person. And his work, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Death and resurrection. Person and work. We glorify him as God. We give him thanks. You have to. God commands it. If you refuse, you're under his judgment. And music fits that category. Ultimately, the gospel centers on the person and work of Christ, and so the pagans are lost and headed for hell because giving glory to God and thanksgiving are the two things that the pagans refuse to do. 
And so God turned them over, as we see in Romans 1, to sodomy and filthiness. I hope you see the connection to our study on music. That means that those pagans also refused to give him glory in their music. Because music is one of the most essential key elements of worship. Remember that. Music is not just to sort of take it as you find it and, you know, you can have it, you don't have to have it. It is one of the essential elements everywhere in Scripture of worship. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. So we ask the question, are we personally, individually, and accountably living that way every day with every fiber of our being and, listen carefully, with all the music that we use. God never gives a command unless he also gives the divine power to obey it. God has given you his word so that you will know what he requires. He has given you his Holy Spirit so that you will have the necessary power. Does the great command do all to the glory of God inform every one of your deeds, your words, your thoughts, your attitudes, your motives? Does do all to the glory of God control the type of music that you listen to? Does that unchanging command by Almighty God control all of your interpersonal relationships with your spouse, your children, your family members, the church, the unregenerate world around you, your approach to all of life? Does it shift your focus to the divine viewpoint, your interaction and choices in this temporal world? Or do we all of us need to repent and begin walking by faith and in obedience to the will of God? Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. That says I'm done. I have one more minute on my watch. One more minute. Just two more points. As a corollary topic, let me touch briefly on the adversary who wants you to listen to the wrong kind of music. As the enemy of God, Satan wants the glory. And right now, he controls the glory of earth. He hates it when Christians give glory to God and use music that truly glorifies God. We learn that from the narratives in Matthew and Luke. Matthew chapter 4, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Again, the devil taketh him up to the exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The devil wants the glory. And he wants to do anything he can to stop you from giving glory to God. When you violate the principles that we've been talking about of doing all to the glory of God, the devil has just won another little skirmish. And one skirmish after another till he wins a battle. And then finally he convinces you that the kind of music to listen to is the kind that gives him glory and not God. Wish we could go on. I still have quite a few pages to go but the Lord willing we'll pick it up there next week our gracious heavenly father how we thank you once again for the great truths of your word you've given us principles by which to live you've outlined and detailed those principles and then you tell us to apply them to every area of life you didn't just give us a list of which songs to listen to and which songs not to listen to you told us how to test the spirits You told us what brings you glory, and you list for us many things that bring you glory, and then we apply that to the different areas, art and music and friendships and everything else. And as we apply it to music especially, we ask, how does this cause us to bear the fruit of the Spirit? How does this music motivate us to exercise our spiritual gift? How does this music bring the unbelieving world 
under conviction of sin and a recognition of the judgment to come. How does this music demonstrate that our whole heart, soul, strength, and mind belong to Jesus Christ and to no one else? How does this music motivate us to holiness and purity? How does this music remind us of the great and precious promises of God and turn our thoughts toward heaven? How does this music encourage us and strengthen us in times of persecution and sufferings? Father, help us to learn to apply your word, not just to look for sound bites, not just to say, well, I don't see it spelled out that way, that I cannot listen to Van Halen or I cannot listen to Rolling Stones or I cannot. Father, help us not to be imbeciles, stubborn imbeciles who decide that the flesh is what we want. Cause us to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, that we might glorify Jesus Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing